I'm Josh LeCount with Temple of Geek, and I'm here with film and TV composer Kevin Kiner. How you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? I am awesome. I am so excited to talk to you this morning. I really, really appreciate your time. Oh, it's my pleasure. I think we both got our coffee here. so Yeah, uh, man, we got to get juiced. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing I wanted to ask you, I guess the best place to start would be the beginning, because I'm so curious about that. I, I saw online that you used to play music. Uh, in a band is that right yeah yeah sure yeah that's how I started I I don't have any classical training any formal training in music at all um so I was playing Led Zeppelin and yes and Eric Clapton and all that kind of stuff when I was in the 70s and did you always know that you were going to eventually be a composer like was that a natural Uh, progression well that's um no, I, I, I definitely didn't. Um, yeah, it, it, I mean, my mom was really supportive. My mom was divorced, and so she was raising me. She was pretty tough back then in those days. Um, and she just told me she supported my music. She, We had rehearsals at my house, or you know, she would take me to rehearsals, or she would take me to gigs, or I was in a bunch of jazz bands as well, big bands. And she just told me once I went to college, I had to choose like doctor or lawyer, you know, and that was it. I, and I literally went to UCLA and I looked, you know, to the science department. And then I looked at the humanities department is like, mm, which way am I going to go? <laughs> and I, I chose pre-med. I was going to be a psychiatrist because uh, I really I can't stand blood. So I would have been I would have been a terrible doctor. I think <laughs> I would have been OK psychiatrist, maybe. But whatever um (laughs) you know I started gigging to make extra money like in my junior year at UCLA and and fortunately like I'd applied to Notre Dame to get into college and I I didn't get in but I did get into UCLA and if I'd gone to Notre Dame I probably wouldn't have gigged because there wouldn't have been those kind of like LA kind of gigs and stuff um and it may have been vastly different um wow so yeah, I, I you know who came? I don't know if you know who Kenny Loggins is. Oh um, yeah, um, yeah, he wrote all the Top Gun tunes and you know really good. And he came to UCLA, and he his, a similar thing happened to him, and he was going to UC Riverside. He told the story, and he he one day because he was going to be an accountant to fall back if music didn't work out, and he said he realized he was spending all or 90% of his time on what he was going to fall back on. And I, you know, I, I've never met him. I, I hope to meet him someday and tell him, I, I don't know if that singularly changed my life, but that was a big, that was a big deal. I came home from that, you know, seeing him talk at Ackerman union and really started thinking about like, yeah, man, that's, you know, I don't know that I want to do what I'm setting out to do right now, you know? Right. Right. And then I, I read something that you said that you picked up a, a John Williams uh, uh, book, right? With yeah. all the scores. And that was a big influence. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the genesis of like film scoring and stuff. I had a very good friend who became a session guitar player. And I saw that that was a way to make a good living in the music business without having to rely on pretty much pure luck you know and in, in terms of like if you were going to be the next Beatles or something like that you know uh, if you had the skills you could work as a session guitar player and um so I and then I became aware of the film scoring and the television scoring genres and 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 jobs and then I heard like Superman and I heard Star Wars and it, it, at that time it was just completely opaque to me um I mean, I remember thinking, how does he make that sound? So I went out, I went out and bought the score. And I mean, I'm still look, I mean, this is Wagner, um, which I'm kind of ripping off for a curtain project. (laughs) No, I just, you know, I'm always studying. I I, I think I've always overcompensated for my lack of formal education by continuing to be a student of, of, you know, classical music and orchestration and just different licks and different ways of doing things. 
Oh, there's so many things that I wish we had time to talk about, but I guess to kind of like, you know, get up to uh, what we're talking about today a little bit, we're going to talk about the new Sylvester Stallone movie, uh, Samaritan, yeah. which I am uh, excited to hear about the process with this because it's a little bit different from what you'd normally hear in most Marvel kind of superhero movies, I guess is a better way to put it. Yeah. And uh, you compose this, uh, it's a co-score with uh, uh, Jed Kurtzel, correct? Yeah. yeah Can you Jed's tell me a little bit about that composer. process? So Jed and I were at this symposium called Soundtrack Cologne in Cologne, Germany. And he, I mean, literally, I sat down to lunch and there's this guy, I'd never met him. He's sitting across the table from me. And we start talking about kind of action cues, you know, and um, and, and how, how demanding those are. And, uh, and there's just a bunch of things and, that <clears throat> that make them quite difficult in many different ways and sometimes they change the cut sometimes you know and there's different ways to approach an action scene and all these things we started talking about that and i really enjoy doing action cues and uh, and um i think that stuck in jed's brain and and what happened with the film was he started out doing it with julius who he'd work with on overlord and some other things i think and um the schedule got just mangled and COVID happened and all this stuff. And, and Jed called and asked me for some help. Um, and so initially I was just going to help with some of the action stuff. And then it just evolved into more of a, <clears throat> a true collaboration. Um, actually, thank goodness for me, because I had to really, really study Jed. Um, I, I co-write a lot like David Arnold and, you know, um, Gustavo Santolaya, Clint Mansell, and I I make it a big point to to really understand those guys that I co-write with and and try to uh, make the soundtrack not sound like two different composers, you know, and, okay. and meld myself into them. Over the course of my career, I think I've really grown by doing this, you know. Um, but uh, so I had to really, Jed's a tough nut to crack. And he himself said, like, you know, it's something like, well, I don't know how you study me because I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> kind of, and and which is the kind of the cool thing about him. And especially as we're moving, you know, film scoring forward, um, we're all trying to do something that nobody's ever heard before, you know, and Jed has a very unique voice. So if I had done all that studying of, of Jed and, and trading of sounds and uh, all these different things that you do and only done a couple of action cues, man, that would have been like kind of a drag because I, I would have done so much more work and only written two pieces of music or something. So it was cool that it, that it you know, it wound up to be a, you know, kind of a 50-50 thing. What and what kind of a, a instrumentation approach it was different about this one than some of maybe your <clears throat> work? Well, Jed has a sound palette that is really unique to him. And, um, you know, without getting into details, he just has a very specific way of working, which is very quirky and very unusual. Um, and I had to get into that sound palette. And especially in, in Samaritan in particular, I don't know if you've watched the film, but mm -hmm. the character is a very broken, mangled character. And that one, it, you know, Jed wanted it, that to be reflected in the score. So there are these, these bending strings, these bending synths. Um, sometimes you don't know if it's real strings or if it's a synth. It, it, we used real orchestra on it, but we we blend those sounds and those motifs together in in such a way that it reflects the kind of brokenness of Stallone's uh, character and his his emotional journey. Wow. And and you're used to using, well, I mean, like I've seen so many different types of instrumentation in a lot of your different videos. The, how do you pronounce it? The guitar, uh, viol. 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 Guitar, yeah. Guitar viol. There's, yeah. Did you use anything <clears throat> like that in this comp uh, score? Um, I did not use guitar viol in this score. Jed had already played a cello lick, which features prominently in the score and it's uh cyrus's initially it was kind of cyrus's theme it plays throughout the score um and it's kind of this he, he's bowing and it's kind of bending and um uh he's not a cello player you know but it was kind of on purpose like a out of tune but in a kind of good way vibe um and so 
I took the audio file of that and and the same that Jed would take that and put it into different cues. And then I, I we had that idea because we had a really great orchestra at Sony, one of the first back from COVID um, uh, that were recording. So I played that cello lick that Jed had done for the guys. I mean, you, you've got like eight or 10 of the greatest cello players on earth. And I didn't, I, I mean, we wrote it and we notated, but, but it's pretty hard to notate because he played it so unusually. Right. Um, so I, I played it for all the cats, you know, and, and I explained the character and, and we talked about like, and so in the room, you know, the guys started coming up with ideas of how they would execute that wow. because now they have an unprofessional thing that they want to kind of in their professional way, do it. And, and so we came up with maybe three or four variations of what Jed had done on the solo cello. Some of it was a solo guy. Some of it was like all eight guys. Um, some with the basses played at the same time too. Uh, and, th and that became a really cool way to kind of grow the motif, you know? Right. Um, and, and did you get to, like, I'm not sure, I know it's probably different for each project, but did you get to score two picture? Like yeah. as you're watching? Oh yeah. It's amazing to me because when you're, when you're watching a film, obviously, you know, this better than anyone, the score is one of the most important things. And it's like, it's so cool to see how much that adds to specific moments in the film. And when you're, I know you're doing it with, with uh, 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 Jed here. Um, is that when you decide what moments get the score, is that something that was already pre-done beforehand or is that something in the <clears> moment? <throat> I think that, you know, that's a lot of times the director has big input on that. And Julius definitely had some ideas about that. Um, so, you know, that's more. And then the actual execution of it is up to Jed and myself. Um, I will say just when you were describing it, I kind of flash back to because I mean, I I've gotten to work on these just amazing projects in my life, you know, like Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I grew up with this, you know, I, I you know, I, I was at UCLA. I think I was a sophomore or freshman in 77 when Star Wars came out. I, I don't know what year Rocky came out like that, too. Right. I mean, yeah. was it the 70s? I, I, and, I think so. And or early 80s. I, and so here's Sylvester Stallone. And he does a really good job in this movie. Um, and just being able to, you know, to score him, to try to do justice to the character. I mean, it's, it's Sylvester Stallone a, is, is a real actor, you know, yeah. and, and he, I've had this discussion with James Gunn. James Gunn is a huge Sylvester Stallone fan. And he's like, you know, he's the real deal. Stallone's the real deal. I mean, yeah. he's a super, you know, he's a super, he's an action star. He's a great actor. And God, what a privilege, you know, so just pinch myself, right? I can't imagine, man. Like you, the work, the work you've done on so many projects, I get excited just thinking about it. I mean, well, since you're talking about James Gunn, you've also scored for Peacemaker. And, and I would, I mean, I listen to that and I'm like, man, this is so cool because you're getting to incorporate obviously like uh, uh, for the theme orchestral big pieces, but you also have like rock and roll and like yeah. different instruments. What was that like? Yeah, here, I'll show you what I use on Peacemaker. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You are making my day right now. Oh, my so, gosh. This is an ESP. This is the guitar of death, right? This is what the hair metal guys. Well, I don't know if hair metal guys use this, but <laughs> anyhow. Yeah, this is my uh, this is my Peacemaker guitar. Oh, my gosh. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, the model of where Peacemaker was late 80s, early 90s hair metal is a lot of... So we had to kind of meld that in with the orchestra. Um, God, James Gunn knows his music. It's crazy. He's talking about this, these groups like Cinderella and Hanoi Rocks. <laughs> I'd never heard of Hanoi Rocks. Um, <laughs> I, I hadn't either. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but apparently they were quite seminal in terms of their influence back then. You know, there was Van Halen and them and maybe even them before Van Halen. I'm not sure. But I mean, he'll talk your ear off like for an hour about the influences of these amazing bands and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up playing in a band, too, and, and playing hair metal and all that stuff. And when I heard the score for Peacemaker, I was like, man, this is this is just something unique. And it's really cool. You did an outstanding job. I mean, there's so many there's so many things I, I, I wish we had time for. But it's like, man, I mean, your work on Hell on Wheels, that was amazing. Oh, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, that would, and I believe that one you got to use a lot of the guitar uh, viol. Yeah, here's 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 one of them. I have like five of them, um, but this wow. is one of the newer ones, and you know it's 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 bowed, but it has frets. Um, yeah. How, how yeah, does that work that, exactly? Pardon? How does that exact? Because it sounds a lot like a cello, a little bit. Yeah, like, it how sounds does that work cheap, like a cheap kind of bad cello in a way, you know, because <laughs> it's it's a smaller body. So I mean, you know, we all can get a really rich cello sound. So this is like a little earthier, you know, and um, and not quite Chinese, you know, Erhu violin, but but it's somewhere in between, you know, and um, right. Yeah, I, I use that, and I use some Middle Eastern instruments on uh, Hell on Wheels um, thing called a tambour, which has a big long neck, and we, I bowed that. It's not the Middle Eastern guys never bow it; they always strum it. But wow. I took a, a violin bow on to it. It 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 just matched that. I mean, everything was so perfect with that show, and and the way you did the music with that, it just it really felt like I don't need, like a Western mixed with like just this. I don't even know how to explain it. It, it was just. It was so good, man. It was. Oh, so thank good. you. You're welcome. That's one of my favorite projects I've ever worked on in my life. Um, if you get the chance, watch uh, Dark Winds on AMC because okay. it's not the same sound because it has to do with uh, Native Americans, but it still harkens to the desert and to the West. And and um, I do I do a different thing. Uh, with that and I, I co-write that with my sons as well who are oh, really yes. very good yes which uh brings us to star wars which i got to talk to you about star wars since you're here i mean what <laughs> I've, and you've, you've done some work with your sons with star wars uh, yeah. i just i don't even know where to begin here because i'm like what was it like to just be playing the piano and knowing you're playing the force theme yeah with your music yeah i mean that's a big that's a big deal um you know, I was hired by George Lucas and Dave Filoni, and really both of those guys have been tremendous influences on my career, my life, my way of thinking about things. Um, you know, just two of the nicest people you'll ever meet, and also more most creative people you'll you'll ever meet. Um, and it's been a great journey. I just, you know, we finished. Um, a new one that's coming out called Tales of the Jedi, which is a very special project of Dave's. And I am i just couldn't be happier with anything than the score that's, that I did for that. I'm just working on now the season finale of Bad Batch, and we're gonna record that in Vienna, Austria. Um, and that's a, that's a really cool uh, uh, score that's going to, and we're going to release the score. Disney's going to release the score concurrent with that, the release of the show. Wow. So we're really excited about that too. I, it's got to be a, an amazing feeling. I heard um, Dave Filoni say that you understand the characters just as well as he does. That he, <laughs> with, with, I mean, come on, that is to have Dave Filoni say that. Yeah. That's yeah. So cool, man. You know, I, I do talk about that with with guys who come in and want to, you know, be film composers. Um, you know, I took I, I was in plays when I was in high school. I was a, like a drama kid and a band kid. I was like every nerdy thing that whatever repels females. I was <laughs> and, and so uh, but I, I feel it was really important that uh I was in drama and I, and, and I, you know, I, I played characters and, and I started to understand drama and writing and, um, and, and, and the structure and, and, and all those things, you know, in addition to music, because really I'm not in the music business, I'm in the film and television business and I am servicing a story and I'm servicing characters that are, that are being used to tell that story. And, and that's that is my job is to support that and, and and to without beating the audience over the head, you know, show them where the story is going and where the character is going, give little hints of things, you know, and it, right. I think about that a lot. My son, my my oldest and, and youngest. Well, I have three kids. My daughter's the middle child, but both my sons are working with me and. 
I mean, we have like rollicking discussions about character over the breakfast table, you know, it's really interesting. It's so cool. I mean, and, and being, the, I think it's so cool that like Ahsoka's theme was your creation. Mm -hmm. And that right. is so cool. What is that like to see now that coming to live action now and seeing Ahsoka now over in Mandalorian, now her own show? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there are several themes of mine that, are, you know, that are part of the canon. And, you know, that's cool. Right? Yeah. You know, it's just, it, it, there's just, I never imagined that, you know, I would be in the position that John Williams is in that other guys are doing my theme and, you know, and, 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 you know, like, uh, doing, doing a really nice job with it and, and, and paying attention, doing it justice, uh, you know, it's, it's great. I think I have a memory of when I was a child before I even like started listening to scores or anything like that. And it's just amazing how I have this memory of sitting in front of the TV and I and I knew I was watching Superman, but but I just rem I can remember as a kid hearing that dun 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 uh -huh. school, and I was just like, that was so impactful that I love that John Williams is such an influence on you and your work that you can hear that you are really going for those themes and those memorable things because that is what's carried Star Wars and all these different projects over that you've been working on. It's been such a key factor. Yeah. Um... And I am a big proponent of melody still. And melody is 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 a little less, you know, important these days. And and different producers, different studios have different ideas of how much melody to put. But one thing I you know I always an example I use is I'm a basketball I'm a sport kind of sports fan and. Um, Dwight Howard is a great center, and he was playing for the Houston Rockets at that time. Um, and, you know, he's kind of known as Superman, or that was like one of his nicknames. And at the height of his career, they would play. And 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 I, I walked into a meeting one time, and, and I'm talking about Melody. And I'm like, so guys, when Dwight Howard goes in, you know, the, the, and, and they introduce him, what do you think, what are they going to play? Are they going to play, you know, Hans Zimmer's The Man of Steel theme, or are they going to play, the, you know, John Williams' Superman theme? You know, and... And this is not a knock on Hans Zimmer. Right. It, it's it, it it's it shows how John Williams is head and shoulder above anyone who's ever done it. And it doesn't matter if you're even Ennio Morricone or uh, who's really great, mm -hmm. or you know Tom Newman. There, these are great. Uh, Harry Gregson Williams, John Powell. These are some of my favorite composers, by the way. Yeah. John Williams just kicks all of our ass I yeah. know, it's just way better than any any of those names i just mentioned <laughs> no i agree it's, i mean et indiana jones I mean, yeah. you name it it's just like those are the ones that are they will forever and ever and ever be here and they will always be these great these great scores and i have i have one more question i know this might be a stupid question but i'm so curious as to when you're you know, coming from a, my head, I'm coming from a band background. And when we're recording, you know, you have different instruments and you're mixing and you take each instrument as you go. I'm curious as when you've recorded as an orchestra and the mixing and mastering comes around, are those put to like, let's say you got the violins over here. Let's say you've got the different sections. Are those mixed separately or is it, is it each individual yeah. instrument? How does that work? I'm just so curious. You know, it's a case by case basis. Um, some some shows like for instance on Samaritan we would record even though they were all in the room we would record just the fiddles and then just the violas and then just the cellos and then we processed them because that was part of our mangling thing was that we didn't really want any of the orchestra to sound pure we want them to sound you know and so we put it like there's this thing called a decapitator made by sound toys which is a processor and you could really distort the hell out of it, you know, and we kind of found a sweet spot. Um, and that cello lick I was telling you, when the guys would play that, we ran that through a couple of different processors with the mixer. And so we need them isolated in that kind of case, because if you're going to distort something, you don't want the, you know, the violins to be leaking into the cellos and stuff. So you you have to strategize um, for a project, whether you're going to need that isolation or not. Right. Well, man, I, I just want to tell you, thank you so much for your time this morning. I have thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. Yeah. Um, for those uh, watching August 26th, 
uh, the Samaritan or Samaritan, excuse me, uh, yeah. is going to be on Amazon Prime. Yeah. So everyone needs to check that out because it's 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 great. It's a great score. It's it's Fester Stallone can't beat that. So yeah. um, congratulations on all on all of your work, and I'm excited to hear all the all the new things coming coming down the pike. Thank you, man. It's great to meet you. All right, you too, man. I hope you have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.